Great. And I hope that the video started and we can start. So hello, everyone. Let me share the presentation. Hope that the screen is sharing. Uh, welcome to our study STEM in the United States live stream. My name is Hani and I'm the Education USA advisor in the Czech Republic at the Fulbright Commission. Today I have a special guest from Milwaukee School of Engineering, Lucia. Thank you for joining us, Lucia. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so let's start with introducing the Education USA. Uh, which is a network uh, that provides free and accurate and comprehensive information about study opportunities in the United States. So, uh, guys, if you're thinking about studying in the United States at high school, at a university level, please feel free to reach out to us and we'll be happy to help. Uh, the advising center that I work for is located in Prague, Czech Republic. I'm located at the Fulbright Commission. So for those of you who would like to meet in person, uh, definitely just send me an email to advisor at Fulbright and I'll be happy to schedule a meeting or I am happy also to connect with you online. And apart from the Education USA Advising Center, there are other American centers all around the Czech Republic. Uh, so feel free to visit them because you will find um, a library definitely in each one of them. Then we offer live streams such as this one, but we have different topics and uh, we also offer consultations. They can be in person or online. Uh, if you manage to scan the QR code, code uh, that will get you to our uh, newsletter subscription. Uh, I put together a newsletter once a month, so feel free to uh, subscribe to it and it gives you all the information about uh, what's new in the US higher education system and what to do, you know, if you are applying and so forth. And then follow us on social media under Education USA Check, because that's when you get all the information, all the news and everything that's happening. And now I would love to turn it to Lucia, uh, because today we are going to talk about STEM. Uh, STEM is uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. So all of these majors and uh, Lucia is an expert about it. So she will share more information. <laughs> all right. So let me just share my screen here. All right, yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about STEM education in the United States. Um, and then we'll go into a little bit about like different types of schools that are in the United States, the application process, tuition, scholarships available. And then at the end, I'll talk a little bit about the school that I represent, Milwaukee School of Engineering, just so you can kind of get an idea um, of that. So yeah, it'll be more, uh, we'll focus on STEM, but then it'll be comprehensive as well, just kind of, introduction to um, higher education in the US. That's amazing, yeah. So um, STEM majors, just like you mentioned, um, science, technology, engineering, math. Um, these are just like the most up and coming majors within the US and all over the world, honestly, just with um, technology advancing. Um, technology kind of goes into all, all four of these um, kind of differentiates there. And so technology is integrated in science in a lot of different capacities with like the different labs that you'll do um, and the different technology you need to do certain experiments and stuff like that. Um, technology is very integrated in engineering and you use technology with basically everything you do within engineering and then math as well. Um, you know, we're not computing equations on a piece of paper as much anymore. You know, we're using technology to, to have it do the hard work for us. And then we're just kind of analyzing whatever um, the technology is using. And then technology itself, you know, whether it's building computers or doing IT or information technology stuff, um, it's just expansive that way, so. Mm. So you might be thinking, why, why should I get a, a STEM degree? Why not just like go right into the workforce um, and, you know, like just start working right away? So you can see on this graph here, um, on the left is like all the STEM occupations and what kind of education they require. And on, on the right is all the occupations ever in the, in, that you could think of. Mm -hmm. um, so the green is going to be everything, every job that requires a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can see on the left that 
most STEM degree or STEM occupations do require a bachelor's degree at least. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's a little bit that you could do with an associate's degree and even a little lower, but majority of the, the work that you're going to be doing, if you're interested in STEM, will require some sort of formal education. Um, and then you can see at the very top there, that little blue, that's going to be like even higher level, whether it's a professor that has a, a doctorate um, or doing like really intense research or that sort of thing is going to require even higher degree um, compared to on the right where there's, you know, like a much more even distribution of educations required um, or education level required. Um, Can I jump in, Lucia? So for mm -hmm. Czech students, uh, the associate degree means that you would uh, study for two years in the United States, and uh, it can be a community college. Uh, so some students actually take two years at a community college, and you can get an associate's degree. And then some students continue on a four-year uh, university or college, and they finish their bachelor's degree because we don't have an associate degree in the Czech Republic. So this, this may be new for them. So I just see. so you know, guys, uh, you can study for two years in the United States and end up with an associate degree. A uh, bachelor's degree, on the other hand, takes four years, whereas in the Czech Republic it's three years. But in the US, it takes you four years and you will get your bachelor's degree. So that's you know, you. what are the terms here. Yeah. Thank you for that specification. That's helpful. <laughs> So this number is projected to go up just with technology advancing and, and everything in that way. The number is just going to go up even higher that will require like formal education in that capacity. Mm -hmm. um, so here's just a little statistic that we found. Um, the US Bureau of Labor Statistics for the between like 2019 and 2029 projected. Um, they're projected to show that occupations in the STEM fields are, you know, they're anticipated to grow by 8% within the next seven years. Mm -hmm. um, so that's compared to only about 3.7% for all the other occupations. And so it's almost, you know, the occupations within the STEM field are expected to grow at more than double compared to the other occupations. So um, if you're thinking about job security, like once you get your bachelor's degree, it's STEM is where you should definitely go into. So. Mm -hmm. so with that, even computer occupations, like even more specific, um, you know, such as security analysts, software developers, computer scientists, that sort of thing, they're projected to grow by 11 and a half percent. So that's even higher um, mm -hmm. because this is the largest growing, um, you know, like field within the STEM related jobs. So. Mm -hmm. You're really good at doing computer things and, and good with like math and that sort of thing. Computer is, is where it is a good field definitely to go into. Mm -hmm. So then um, we'll talk a little bit about like the difference between undergraduate and graduate here in the US. Um, so like you mentioned, undergraduate degree typically takes about four years to complete. Sometimes it can take students a little longer depending on if they go part time. Um, which as an international student, you're not allowed to go part-time, so you don't really have to worry about that. Um, mm -hmm. But here in the U.S., some students will be working, and so it might take them a little longer. But if you attend full-time, mm -hmm. the average um, time to completion is about four years. Mm -hmm. And that's taking at least 12 credits per term. Mm -hmm. um, that's considered full-time, which you have to remain full-time on an F-1 visa, which mm -hmm. is what you should you know, be studying here in the U.S. on. Um, and then you need at least a, a high school education to be qualified to be admitted into an undergraduate um, mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. And then the difference between that and a graduate program is that you need to have at least a bachelor's degree. Um, mm -hmm. Or if you complete your bachelor's degree in the Czech Republic, um, we, tip, we personally require a West evaluation, which is like a third party company who will evaluate your, your degree from another country and determine what it's equivalent to on a U.S. Mm -hmm. education system. Um, so if it's three years, but we would recognize it as a bachelor's degree, that West evaluation would be what um, would determine that for us, because we're not knowledgeable about every education system in the U.S., and so we mm -hmm. would uh, use that third-party company. Mm -hmm. And then full-time for a graduate student is um, nine credits. So mm -hmm. typically, each class is only about three credits, whereas in an undergraduate, it's about four credits. So it's just a little mm -hmm. bit different that way. Mm -hmm. typically, and typically the classes are a little bit more challenging too. So a full course load is going to be a little less credits um, just because it will take you a bit longer to, to get the content. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then a graduate degree on average is about two years to complete as well. Again, it might be a little quicker. It might be a little longer depending on what degree 
specifically you're looking to obtain, um, but on average, it's about two years to complete. Mm -hmm. So once you get your bachelor's degree, um, you know, you have two kind of main options. You can either go right to graduate school to obtain your master's degree, um, which, you know, there's a lot of different master's degrees, whether it's in business, like an MBA, um, the Master of Science in Engineering Management. There's more um, specific programs, like if you want to even grow on the, the information that you learned in your undergrad, you can be more specialized in your graduate degree. Mm -hmm. or you can just work right away in the field of study. Mm -hmm. um, so typically, um, especially majors like programs in the STEM fields are going to prepare you really well for just going right into the your field of study. You mm -hmm. don't necessarily need a graduate degree um, for these because you're doing a lot of like hands-on learning in your undergraduate program. You typically are ready to just jump right in and, um, you know, work in your field of study right away. What's really interesting regarding international student is that OPT, you know, after studying STEM, are we are we going to talk about it or can we bring it up now? Sure, yeah, we can talk about it now. Mm -hmm. so it's actually for you guys, it's optional practical training that allows you to stay in the United States after you finish your bachelor degree studies, potentially. And when it's a different major other than STEM, you can stay up to one year. But if it's a STEM major, you can stay up to two years and work basically in, in the field of what you study. So that allows you to stay two more extra years in the United States and work in the field that you studied in, which is a great deal. Uh, other students who are not a STEM major can stay only up to one year. And then, you know, they have to apply for a different visa or come back to the Czech Republic. So optional practical training, because sometimes you ask me, you know, what to do when I finish my bachelor's degree. If you study a STEM major, you can then stay for two years and uh, get some practical training there as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, this kind of goes right in with mm -hmm. OPT is CPT. Um, mm -hmm. So getting an internship during your undergraduate program is going to be immensely helpful for a lot of different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, because employers, whether they're in the U.S. or you're wherever you're looking to get, you know, work, are mm -hmm. going to look for students who have that real-world experience mm -hmm. um, and who have already, you know, had experience working in the field. And so, when you're looking at schools to attend in the United States, make sure that you ask your admissions counselor, or whoever you're contacting, about CPT. So, mm -hmm. CPT is curricular practical training, um, and that is what you can do while you're actually still studying. So OPT is for when you already graduated, but CPT is during um, mm -hmm. your graduate studies. And so make sure you ask about that and what's available and like what other students have done in that capacity. Um, and then it also just helps with networking. Um, so you're gonna meet a lot of different people once you're you know, working at an internship and it allows you to make those connections. And even if they can't you know, employ you at their current you know, uh, an occupation, they might know somebody at a different company who's looking for somebody um, who they could maybe match you up with. Um, so it's just a really good networking opportunity. And then it's also really good for career development. So it allows you to kind of explore the field because um, typically with any, you know, study that you do any major or degree, it's not just going to be like one specific job that you're eligible for. You are probably qualified for a lot of different jobs within your field. And so it allows you to kind of explore and see what you like to do and maybe what you would not like to do quite as much within your field. Um, so it's a nice way to just kind of get like a sample of the job before you'd actually commit and you know be working there full time. So it's really nice. It allows you to grow personally as well, you know, experience a professional atmosphere and that sort of thing. And then it also gives you a competitive edge against other students who maybe haven't had internship experience. Um, so they'll have to do a lot more like on the job training versus you who has already had that during their undergraduate studies and can just be employed right out of college and, and kind of hit the ground running is kind of a thing we hear say in the US here. So. Mm -hmm. 
So just another quick statistic that we found, 72.2% um, of college graduates with internship experience got a job offer um, in contrast to only about 36.5% for those who didn't complete one. So mm -hmm. your chances of getting a job um, after graduating is almost double if you have some sort of internship. So it's just really important um, to look for that when you're looking at what school to attend. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple different ways you can find internships. Um, a lot of schools will have a career fair where you can um, interview with a lot of different uh, companies and they're right on campus. So that's really convenient. You don't have to like drive to all these different companies to interview. Um, and it allows you to kind of get a sampling of, of different career options that are out there and what kind of internships opportunities there are all in one location, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. um, some schools will have company partnerships so that they work closely with certain companies and they um, will kind of match you with these companies depending on what your major is. Mm -hmm. um, some companies won't, so it just, or excuse me, some schools won't, so it just kind of depends on mm -hmm. what school you would attend. Um, and then a lot of research institutions um, do have like a really strong relationship with you know, kind of reputable companies. So definitely look into that and like research your institution that you're looking at to mm -hmm. see what kind of reputable companies they are partnered with. Mm -hmm. um, and then the size of the school that you're looking at also will determine kind of the level of competition you have for internships. So I use the school I represent. Um, we have less than 3000 students total at our school and we had over 380 companies at our career fair. So mm -hmm. if you do the math there, it's competitive, but not quite like there's a lot of opportunities for students to get an internship because there's so many companies interested in our students. Mm -hmm. um, so there's just lots of opportunities to be able to get an internship. Whereas, you know, if you're competing, if there's maybe only 100 companies mm -hmm. and there's um, 10,000 students competing, it's going to be a lot more difficult to get those internships. So just kind of look at that, too, um, when you're looking at schools. Mm -hmm. So we'll go into a little bit about like types of schools that we have here as well. Um, so the picture you'll see here is a, a big lecture hall at one of our like larger schools. Um, so there's, you wanna look at like how big of a school you wanna attend, um, which will determine kind of the class sizes that you'll be in. Mm -hmm. So the picture you see, this is probably a lecture hall of maybe 200, 300 students, which mm -hmm. would be at a school where like the population is maybe 20, 30,000 students. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll typically have like big lecture halls full of students in these bigger institutions just so that they can house all these students and, and have space big enough to educate them. And then mm -hmm. at smaller schools, they're going to have a lot smaller classes um, comparatively. So you might only have like 20 or 30 students in your class. So it's a bit more intimate. Um, and then it kind of speaks to like the professor interaction that you'll have. So at these bigger schools. Um, you'll have the professor, or maybe there might be a teaching assistant as well, who will be helping kind of manage all these students. Mm -hmm. uh, and they might not know your name just because there's 300 students in one class, there might be another 300 in another class. So it's more of like um, each student kind of has to be more intrinsically motivated and, and make sure that they're getting their work done. Whereas a smaller school, the professor will know your name. Um, it's a lot more of like a, a closer relationship you'll have with the professors because there's only 30 students in their class and even less as you go up throughout the program. Mm -hmm. um, and then campus culture. So both small and large schools will definitely have opportunities to get involved with student organizations and campus events. Um, so you don't really have to worry too much about that, but it's more like what kind of experience you wanna get. Um, these bigger schools have a lot more like athletic events going on. They have a lot more like a variety of activities going on. So there's a lot of opportunities to get involved. Um, and at, at the smaller schools, you will definitely have opportunities, but they're not, they might not be as focused on like huge sporting events or, mm -hmm. you know, like really big events. It might be more on a smaller scale that way. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whatever kind of experience you want to have, just kind of think about that. And then we have private institutions here and then public institutions as well. So public schools tend to be a lot bigger. Um, you know, those, those schools have maybe 20, anywhere from like 10,000 up to maybe 30,000 students. Um, mm -hmm. And then private schools tend to be a little smaller. There might still be some bigger private schools, um, 
but they tend to be a little bit smaller. Mm -hmm. The tuition will range between public and private schools. Um, private schools will tend to have a, a higher tuition rate compared to public, which will have a lower tuition rate, but the scholarships tend to be drastically different as well. So because private schools tend to be a little bit more expensive, their, two, their scholarships and, and financial aid tend to kind of compensate a little bit for that. Mm -hmm. um, whereas public schools have a lower tuition, but their scholarships might not be quite as high because they don't need to kind of compensate for that tuition. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have most private school, like no public school will have a religious affiliation just because it's kind of, it's against the law here. Mm -hmm. um, but then a private school, there's private schools with religious affiliations, there's private schools without. So it's just kind of, those can go either way because um, mm -hmm. they're not run by the state. They kind of have their own autonomy in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and then some schools are really well known like Harvard, Yale. Most people know those schools just based on their names. And then smaller schools might not be well, uh, you know, might not be quite as well known outside of their little region of the US. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the quality of education at those not those lesser known schools is any worse than like a, a well known school. So just kind of don't necessarily go just based on the name. You want to do your research and make sure that the school that you're going to, um, even if you've never heard of them before, their academics are strong um, and have they kind of check all the boxes that you're interested in. So when it comes to researching schools, sorry, when it comes to researching schools, I usually recommend students uh, using the Big Future from College Board website. Do you have any experience with some other researching tools that might be useful for them? So I think um, one thing is to make sure that the school has the major that you're interested in. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. if you want to go to the school that you've heard of, but they don't have the major you're interested in. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of a, a red flag. It's not uh -huh. necessarily, maybe it won't be a good fit. Um, but in terms of like other researching tools, I mean, Google is an easy one, but it's very broad. Um, so we don't have too, I don't have too, too many tools in terms of like how to research schools, but mm -hmm. it can just kind of take time, so. All right, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then another differentiating factor between schools is like where they're located to within the US. So you can see the two kind of opposites here. Um, there's some schools that are located like right in the city. There's a lot of life going on around there. You know, there, there's um, professional people, there's kids. It's like a very kind of eclectic and diverse um, area there. And then some schools would be located kind of in more of a rural environment where there's maybe cornfields and not quite as many residential houses. Um, neither one is better than the other, it's just kind of what experience you want to have. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then a little bit too that goes into that is like where they're located within the US. You want to think about the weather that they'll have. Um, so Milwaukee School of Engineering, the school I represent is in the very northern part of Wisconsin, which is like kind of right in the middle of the US, but more north. Mm -hmm. um, so we have like cold winters or snow. Um, and then our summers are a little bit more mild, but if you go further south, it's going to be a lot more hot. You're not going to have snow necessarily. Um, so just kind of think about that sort of thing too. If you if you go to a school that has like very dramatic weather, or extreme weather, make sure you're prepared for that when you go there. But you'll have friends; they can help you buy a winter coat or anything like that. Mm -hmm. too, so you don't have to worry too much about that. Mm -hmm. And then make sure you're looking into like campus resources as well. Um, so health and wellness is a big one that's kind of um, gaining more popularity in terms of like helping students be successful um, with their like mental health as well as academic health. And so some schools will have um, like nurse practitioners on staff at the school that can see students and that's their only job. It's just this work at the school and help students there. And then some schools will have partnerships with like community clinics in the area. Um, so they can kind of point you that way, but they won't necessarily have resources on campus um, as well as like health and fitness centers. Most schools will have some sort of health and fitness or, you know, like athletic facility, mm -hmm. um, but just good to like work your physical body as well as your mental brain. Um, Cause you wanna make sure that you're taking care of both um, that mm -hmm. way. 
And then look into the support services they have in terms of like academic advising, um, counseling services, um, and any sort of like accommodations you might need if you have some sort of learning disability or if you need help with like taking extra time on exams, anything like that. Um, make sure you're looking into that and asking your admissions counselor about what they provide at the school. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then financial resources too. Most people don't just have a ton of money laying around to just pay for this out of pocket, right? Uh -huh. um, and so look into the financial aid resources that they have available, whether it's need-based or academic-based. Um, scholarships are going to be a big one that you'll want to look into, which we'll talk about a little bit later, like different resources mm -hmm. um, in that way as well. What are VA services? That's going to be more for like veteran association. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's going to be more for like domestic students, but okay. um, yeah. Okay, thank you. And then looking to most do, most schools will have an on-campus housing requirement um, where like you have to live on campus for the first two years, but some schools might not. So just kind of look into that. And if that's a really big, um, you know, important issue for you is to be able to live off campus and the school you're looking at requires you to live on campus, just kind of weigh that and, and see too. I personally think that living on campus is at least for the first two years is going to be your best option just because exactly. it allows you to really get integrated into the campus life um, it promotes your social life and it, there's just a lot of different benefits for living on campus i mean personally i think it's hard to find an apartment when you already live here so it'd be even hard if you're coming from across the world to try to find an apartment that's like close enough to campus but cheap enough and it just really complicates things but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then one thing I kind of like to highlight is um, resident assistance. I don't know if you guys have this in the Czech Republic, but um, so typically you're not eligible to do it as a first year student. You typically have to be at the school for at least one year before you would apply. Mm -hmm. But it's um, every like residence hall of every floor will have a resident assistant and they are hired by the school, it's a current student. And they are kind of like the, the main resource for students on that floor. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, if there's any sort of maintenance ticket, um, they will host different like events to kind of bring the community together, anything like that. Just kind of, I like to think of them kind of as like the mom of that floor because they really take care of the floor and make sure everything is going smoothly. Mm -hmm. um, everyone's being safe and accounted for in that way. And then it, for compensation of like doing all those duties, you get free housing and free meals. So it's a really good a great option. deal. Yeah, it's a really good option for, you know, cutting your costs down, but also getting like some work experience as well, because it is a job. Um, and then typically you can get another job in addition to it, because it's not like a 24 seven type of job. It's just like when you're on duty and then when you're in your in your room. Um, so it's a really a very, a very good option, I would say. So. That's really cool because I remember when I studied in Pennsylvania, there was mm -hmm. this person called resident assistant and mm -hmm. he always made sure that I was okay and I had everything I needed and yeah. he made this board, you know, all nice and wintry and it was like, mm -hmm. it was really cool to have someone there and know, you know, where to go. So again, for the international students, they're asking me for part-time jobs, which they can only do work study, which is 20 hours per week. But mm -hmm. this may be an option for those of them who are studying the four year, uh, you know, bachelor's degree. So the next after the first year, they can apply to this resident assistant. Uh, can you just like help us where to apply? Or is that the admission office that would give us any more information or yeah, it would likely be through the like residential life office. Mm -hmm. So they mm -hmm. handle all of the, you know, like dorm assignments and, mm -hmm. and on campus housing. Mm -hmm. So typically the timeline is like usually in like January of each year, they'll start hiring or like interviewing for the next September. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, like after about one semester of study is when they'll start looking. Um, and you don't have to do it every year. You could apply um, to do it just your junior, senior year. You could do it one year, all three. Um, some schools, it's going to be a little bit more competitive because there's going to be a lot more students wanting to do it. Um, but I think international students are, you know, like have a unique position at a university. And so they would likely be kind of a better hire than than other students because they're mm -hmm. able to, you know, kind of give a different outlook and, and 
I, I just think international students would be a little bit more competitive in, in getting one of those positions. So right. cool. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we kind of already talked a little bit about this of like on campus housing, all your tuition would be, or excuse me, all of your expenses like um, Wi Fi, utilities, meal plan, all that would be included with like your room and board costs. Promotes mm -hmm. your social life. There's a shorter commute, obviously, because you're already living on campus. You don't necessarily have to drive to school. Um, so those are just kind of some perks of living on campus. And then there are, you know, some perks of living off campus as well. Maybe in your junior, senior year, once you're like really established at the university, um, you have a little bit more privacy, you have more options of like where to live. And then usually you sign a year-long lease rather than just like during the academic school year. So that that is an advantage. You know, if you're doing an internship over the summer, that would be nice to be able to still be able to live in your, in your apartment. Mm -hmm. Not to say, so even if you live on campus, usually you can live in the dorms over the summer as well. You just have to make kind of special accommodations with your resident um, advisor. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. so a little bit about the application process. There's kind of two main application um, kind of models that the U.S. schools follow. One of them is rolling admissions, where there's not really a deadline for you to apply by. They're always accepting applications, always accepting students as they receive their application and supporting documents. Um, so you typically will apply, you know, send all your documents in, and then they can usually have an admission decision pretty quickly within, you know, one to two weeks, because they're always accepting applications. Mm -hmm. um, compared to like a regular admissions process where they're maybe collecting applications for a few months and then they have a deadline and then at that deadline then they'll make a decision at once for all the students that applied. This is going to be more popular for programs that are more competitive to get into where they maybe only have a certain number of spots available mm -hmm. so they want to pick the best candidates versus like the first ones to apply. Mm -hmm. um, so those are kind of the, the two main so is there any advantage of applying into the rolling admission, like first come first serves, or what is the deal with the rolling admissions? So rolling admission is just, it's a lot more of like an open application process. So there's, mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a, a nice because you can apply at any time. So maybe mm -hmm. you apply to a couple of schools that have that regular admission process and, and you don't get in. There's mm -hmm. still all these schools that have rolling admissions. You could still apply and get admitted to them. Great. Mm -hmm. It's nice that way. Mm -hmm. And then here's just some of the, you know, traditional application requirements for schools. Obviously the application has needs to be on file. Sometimes they're free. Sometimes they have an application fee. It just kind of varies school to school. Um, Test scores are tend to be a little bit more optional lately with like post COVID. Um, but if you have an SAT score, that's definitely good to, to submit because it will just make your application a bit stronger. Mm -hmm. Transcripts, we wanna see, you know, that you're academically prepared to study. Some schools will require letters of recommendation. Some will have an essay requirement. Um, if you're studying in the U.S., we need to make sure you speak proficient English, so we need some sort of English proficiency exam, whether it's TOEFL, IELTS, um, if you attended some sort of like international school where all of your classes are taught in English, the requirements mm -hmm. kind of vary school to school and what they'll accept, um, but then we'll need a copy of your passport and a financial guarantee. Typically, you don't need that to make an admission decision. Typically, we need that like afterwards to, to process your I-20. Um, mm -hmm. So, and then for graduate school, a few additional requirements will be like a GRE score, which is kind of like the equivalent of an SAT score, but at the graduate level, mm -hmm. um, and then a personal statement as well, just to say like, why are you interested in the program? Why do you want to go to the school? That sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A few quick tips for like applying is like, make sure that you read all the instructions carefully so you understand like the school you're applying to. Um, I, I can't tell me how many students I have gotten emails from, uh, they've applied and they're like, I'm interested in um, this specific program. And it's like, we don't even offer that program. So it's, you know, uh, make sure you're researching yeah. the school you're looking at. Um, know the deadlines, you know, if you, if you really wanna get into a school and they have that, that application deadline, make sure you're turning your stuff in so you meet that deadline because they're usually not flexible in like mm -hmm. accepting applications late. Um, make sure you're requesting all your transcripts from your high school or college. 
because um, that's something admissions counselor can't do. We require you to, to send them that way. Mm -hmm. And then provide like all the information that's needed, you know, in a, a clear manner and make sure you proofread. So there's no typing errors or grammatical errors, anything like that. You can have maybe a friend or a family relative look at, look through your application and make sure everything looks good. Mm -hmm. A few quick tips about like how to have a competitive um, application this is going to be more applicable for you know like the the schools that have an application deadline where they're picking the best students versus mm -hmm. like rolling admission mm -hmm. um but it's going to be really helpful if you exceed the admission requirement so if they have you know like a a 3.0 um, cumulative grade point average requirement and you have a 3.5 3.7 that's going to make your application a lot stronger um, mm -hmm. same with like SAT scores ATC, ACT scores GRE if your test scores are even higher than the required that's going to make yours more competitive mm -hmm. um, a lot of schools are looking holistically too to make sure that you're you know a good person as well as strong academically so mm -hmm. if you can showcase any sort of community involvement or community service you've done um, that's gonna, you know help your application as well. And then, you know, admissions counselors are reading hundreds of applications, essays. So if you can make yours unique, I know it's a little easier said than done, um, but just make your essay a little unique so that we, it will kind of stick out across other students. Mm -hmm. um, that's also gonna be an advantage. And then try not to wait till like the very last minute to turn everything in, just cause you know, you might have some sort of error that you know you're not able to turn your application in for what, mm -hmm. whatever reason to mm -hmm. just leave yourself some extra time and complete it early mm -hmm. all right so a little bit about tuition and scholarship this is going to be a big play a big factor for a lot of students mm -hmm. um, so make sure that you you know know the cost of tuition living expenses health insurance um before before you commit to attending a school. You wanna make sure that you can afford it. Um, for the I-20, which is a document that like the school will, will issue so mm -hmm. that you can then interview for the visa. Um, we, you have to show proof of at least one year that you can pay for like one year of study. Um, but we've had so many students come here and they can pay for that first year. And then the other three years, they haven't, you know, they've spent all their life savings on that first year. And so make sure you can spend, you know, you can afford to attend it for all the years of study. Cause there's nothing more devastating than having to tell a student like that they can't continue just because, you know, they didn't plan financially. Mm -hmm. They didn't, you know, expect that. So it's it's very, very difficult conversation to have. So just make sure that you, you know, factor all that in when you're looking at a school. Mm -hmm. um, and this is just an example of, of the financial guarantee that we send students to fill out. Um, so it just kind of shows where the funds are coming from. So mm -hmm. we can note that on the I-20 because the government will want to see like, how are you paying for this for the school mm -hmm. um, to make sure you're not like a burden on the U.S. in that way. So health insurance is mandatory on the F-1 visa. So um, make sure you factor that in as well. You can mm -hmm. either bring your own health insurance, you can purchase health insurance from the school you're attending, mm -hmm. um, either way. So, mm -hmm. And then there's a, a couple different types of aid that you wanna watch for. Um, scholarships are gonna be the best ones to get because mm -hmm. those are that's all free money. Um, it does not need to be paid back. It's often based on like your merit, whether that's like um, your test scores or your academics, you know, like how, how you rank within the school. Um, mm -hmm. Talent, sometimes it's like participating in a specific club will get you an extra scholarship. Um, there's lots of different ways you can be um, awarded scholarships. And then grants are kind of similar in that it's also money that doesn't need to be paid back, um, but it, it comes from like a different source. So it's not necessarily like academic or merit-based, it's more, tends to be more like um, need-based grants mm -hmm. that come from the institution. So, and then loans um, is, you know, borrowing money from, mm -hmm. from a bank or whoever that has to be paid back, usually mm -hmm. with interest later. Um, so not the ideal, um, you know, what it, way to pay for school, but sometimes it's a necessary evil to be able mm -hmm. to pay. Um, so, and then sponsorships too. These are a little less popular, but maybe if you have, you know, a really rich aunt who can pay for your school, that would be considered like a sponsorship. Um, or sometimes some countries will have, 
uh, government sponsorships where they'll pay for the certain students to go to school. Um, mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia is really popular for that. Um, but And then work study is a, another option as well. Typically, you can't make enough working on campus to pay for tuition, but it's um, you know a good way to make a little bit of extra money if you wanna to go to the movies or kind of extra expenses, like little things like that, because you can only work up to 20 hours on campus um, and they're not like very high paying jobs. It's more kind of like stuff around campus. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there's institutional aid, which is, you know, like scholarships from the school um, and that grants to the school, that sort of thing. Um, you're not eligible for, you know, U.S. federal aid just because that, that's it's a FAFSA FAFSA is like what domestic students will fill out. And that tells them, um, you know, like what they're eligible to receive from the U.S. government, but unfortunately not eligible for that. Um, so a lot of schools will try to make up for that by making the scholarship a little bit higher. So um, so it evens out a little bit, but then there's other aids as well, which we kind of talked about already. Yeah, and I can add for Czech students, guys, there are Czech foundations that can also help you financially, such as Bakala, Kellner, Nadace Sofia, and so forth. So if you then need these resources, you can find them on our website or just, you know, let me know and I'll be happy to share the list of Czech foundations that uh, are going to help you, you know, financially when studying abroad. Great. Yeah, I didn't know about that. That's a, it's good, a good <laughs> thing to know. So. Yeah. So um, scholarships are, again, going to be probably your best bet for, you know, helping to pay for school because you don't have to pay them back. They're free. Um, you know, you sometimes you have to apply for them. Sometimes you don't. Um, but some schools, you know, will automatically give you certain scholarships for just for, you know, meeting certain criteria. But mm -hmm. there's going to be some extra scholarships usually at schools too that you have to apply for. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes it's like one form that you fill out that will make you eligible for anything. Um, sometimes you have to fill out like multiple forms for each individual scholarship. Um, it just kind of depends on the school and the different kind of financial aid office that they have. Um, so just kind of research institutions and see what kind of aid they, they offer. Um, once you've been admitted to a school, you can definitely have that conversation with your admissions counselor to say, you know, like, what other scholarships might be available for me? Um, how can we bring this cost down to something that we can afford? Just kind of have an open conversation with your admissions counselor that way. Mm -hmm. um, and then typically, like, the size of the school that you go to will also determine what kind of aid they offer. So again, like private small schools might, you know, offer a little bit more in scholarships because the cost is a little bit higher. Um, public schools tend to have a lot more donations from alumni. So they might have an extra, a bigger scholarship fund um, for certain students. So there's just a lot of variability um, in terms of scholarships and aid available. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there are external resources too. We point students to internationalscholarships.com, IEFA. Um, so there's, you know, some external resources that you can look into as well. Mm -hmm. um, the more scholarships you apply to, the better. You know, there's nothing wrong with getting a lot of scholarships. The more, the better, I would say. Mm -hmm. so. The IEFA stands for what? Do you, do you know? I don't know what it stands for. It's just like <laughs> IEFA is like IEFA.com is what the okay. website is. So I'm not so, sure. And what it, it, it gives you like it provides you scholarship opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yep. So okay. you can apply for it. Has different options for like loans as well mm -hmm. as scholarships. So great, great, cool. awesome. Mm -hmm. So I'll kind of breeze through this quickly because um, the cost of living, depending on where you go to school, is going to really vary um, mm -hmm. from state to state, even city to city can really range. Mm -hmm. um, but again, health insurance, you want to make sure that you can account for health insurance when you're figuring out like the cost of attending a school. Mm -hmm. um, whether you want to bring your own health insurance and you know exactly how much that will cost or schools you can purchase, you know, the it can range in cost from like a thousand dollars a year up to twenty five hundred. It really just depends on the school and what what health insurance they partnered with um, within the U.S. Um, if you're thinking about living off campus, you'll just want to factor in like how much rent would be in addition to how much you spend then on food um, to kind of budget that out. And then transportation, you know, if you want to get a car. Um, 
you know, how much gas will be, you know, public transportation, it just, it can really vary a lot. Mm -hmm. All right, so to finish it out, we'll talk a little bit about the school I represent. Mm -hmm. um, I'll try to go quick because I know I've been talking for quite a while now. Um, but yeah, it's been so really I, interesting. Thank you so much, Lucia. Yeah. And I'm excited about the Milwaukee School of Engineering. So yeah. <laughs> So I work at Milwaukee School of Engineering. I've been here about four years now. Um, by far, don't tell anyone else, but by far my favorite students to work with are international students. Uh -huh. um, I also work with graduate students and transfer students as well, but I personally like my international students the best. They're just <laughs> bring the whole like vibrancy and it's, it's, it's always something new every day. So it's really fun. Um, but the picture that you see here, this is of Derek's Hall. So this is our brand new computer science hall. Mm -hmm. um, we just built it in 2019, so it's fairly new. Um, there's a supercomputer in there. There's a lot of different labs for artificial intelligence and augmented reality and kind of the latest technology in terms of, um, you know, like that program. So, mm -hmm. so a few quick facts about us. Um, even though you probably haven't heard about MSOE is like what we call ourselves for short. Um, we are, we're ranked by the US News and World Report as a, our en undergraduate engineering program is ranked 10th. So that's something we're really proud of. Very strong engineering programs, hence the name. Mm -hmm. um, and then our, some of our other programs are also ranked high. You know, actuarial science, which is very math focused, um, is ranked second in the, war in the US. Um, computer engineering is ranked fifth, you know, civil is sixth. So um, our our school holistically is ranked tenth, but then some of our individual programs are ranked even higher, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, we are a very applications oriented program um, or school. So we ha you'll have a lot of labs associated with each of your classes because um, we want you to learn kind of the theory behind things, but also put it to use um, and get a very hands on applications-based education as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also have a nursing program. And so our NCLEX pass rate, which is like the, the final test that nursing students take to be able to practice and become a registered, registered nurse um, in the US or in Wisconsin specifically, um, mm -hmm. our NCLEX pass rate is anywhere from like 90 to 100%, which mm -hmm. is very strong compared to the national average, which is more like 70 or 80%. So mm -hmm. we prepare our nursing students very well. Um, and then, like I mentioned in the slide before, we have a computer science program with, you know, a lot of labs for artificial intelligence. We have a supercomputer that our students can connect to um, and do different projects with. So mm -hmm. all the latest technology that we have. Um, so we're located right in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is just about 90 minutes or 130 kilometers north of Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, we're still a big, we're still in the city. So we have a, a, about 1.6 million people within Milwaukee County. Um, so definitely in more of a, an urban environment, located right on the shore of Lake Michigan. Um, so we're right downtown. There's, you know, corporate America is like right down the street from us, but we're all, our buildings are kind of dispersed um, downtown, all within walking distance, but um, we're kind of right in the, in the heart of it. So there's a lot of things to do around Milwaukee as well. Mm -hmm. We're a smaller school and then we have just uh, just about 2,800 students enrolled. That's undergraduate and graduate students combined. Mm -hmm. um, we have over 100 international students enrolled mm -hmm. currently. So that number is just growing year by year. We kind of took a dip in like 2020, 2021. Of course. Yeah. Uh, but this year, you know, where we had, I think I want to say 40, 40 international students come, which is slowly getting back up um, to where we wanted to be. But it's just, it, COVID was very hard, as everybody knows, you know, especially mm -hmm. for international students. So, um, do you yeah, have any internationals from the Czech Republic? Yeah, we do. We actually have, I know we have for sure one who's here right now. Um, and then we have an exchange program with the Czech Republic as well, with the school. Um, That's amazing. We do a year in the Czech Republic, and then they'll send students to us as well for a whole year. So, Lovely. That's yeah. great. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so we'd have over 30 countries represented. Um, we'd love to get more Czech students. He's a very strong student here. So he's doing very well. Wow. Um, and then we have international faculty as well. So they are computers, one of our computer science faculty members is from India. We have um, a chemistry professor who is from Kazakhstan. So mm -hmm. from all over the world, which is very cool. 
Wow. Um, and then again, we're a university that's really focused on the practical application of what's learned in the classroom because as engineering students, um, you can only learn so much from a textbook. So we, we really want you to get your hands dirty and, and, and apply what you're learning from a textbook into like the real world. <clears throat> Uh, just a list of all of our academic programs that we offer. They're kind of grouped into four little groupings here. Mm -hmm. um, arch architectural engineering, civil engineering, construction management is kind of under that like building and construction um, mm -hmm. kind of umbrella. And then we have a lot of computer majors as well. Um, and then kind of miscellaneous is our, our business program, nursing and then actuarial science as well. Uh -huh. um, and then our uh, other engineering programs are so different from each other that they kind of all just group together that way. Mm -hmm. Wow. So we are a direct entry institution. Um, so what that means is that from the, you know, from day one, you start taking major specific coursework mm -hmm. um, so that there's no like pre-engineering, pre-nursing, nothing like that. So you start taking engineering, you know, if you're a biomedical engineering student, you would start taking a biomedical engineering class right away from day one. So this is helpful in that it really gets you, you know, able to just be exposed to that professor, to that major, like right away. If mm -hmm. you decide maybe this isn't a good fit, you can just switch majors. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to wait till your junior year when you actually start taking major specific coursework, you know right away. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. nice to be able to kind of switch easier and earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll spend over 600 hours of lab time throughout your four years of study. Um, so you'll spend a lot of time in labs. Most <laughs> of your engineering classes will have a lab associated with them. The, with the exception of like English, you don't necessarily need a lab to learn mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. So, And then we have really small class sizes because we're a smaller school. Um, mm -hmm. The per student to professor ratio is about 13 to 1. That's um, nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, your professors will know your name. They want to see you be successful. Their office hours are really flexible. So if you're struggling with a concept or anything, you can just go see them and they really do want to help. Um, we don't have any teaching assistants. And so professors will teach all your classes and all your labs. Um, so that's really nice as well. Um, and we require professors that have at least seven years of industry experience. Mm -hmm. um, so there's nobody coming like right out of college teaching, like they have worked in the industry. They can use those experiences and those examples in their classroom. Um, so it's not as much like theoretical. They can say like, hey, I worked on this project and this is what happened, which mm -hmm. is really nice um, to be able to apply it. And then that your whole final year, you'll work on a senior design project. And so, um, some majors will have, or some programs will assign you the project. Sometimes you'll get to pick it, um, your own kind of project that you want to work on. And then some programs will require you to um, like work with a company and have mm -hmm. them kind of pick what, what they want you to work on. Mm -hmm. So it just, it depends on what your major is. Um, but you spend that whole last year working on it from inception all the way up until usually like a prototype or like presenting to the company or presenting to um, the faculty advisor, whoever it may be. Um, mm -hmm. So it's kind of the, the last step before you would actually be working on projects like as a professional to kind of still have that mentorship from your academic advisor and your professional mm -hmm. advisor. Um, but then it's kind of the best of both worlds because you still have that mentorship, but you also get the freedom to kind of work on it and see what you'd be working on. It's great. It's very meaningful. You know, it's really not just creating a, a paper that is only right. information that you read in the book, right. but this right. is really hands on and mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then we do have a four year graduation guarantee as well. So we can guarantee as long as you, you know, take the classes that we tell you to, you pass mm -hmm. everything the first time. Mm -hmm. um, we can guarantee that you'll only be here four years. So if you need to get into a specific class and it's full, we'll make sure you get into that class. So you're not waiting a whole nother year to take it, which will then set you back in your studies. Um, mm -hmm. So we can make sure that you'll, you'll, you'll graduate on time. So most maybe the most important slide we'll see is cost information. Mm -hmm. um, so tuition and fees, don't just right off the bat, don't be scared by the tuition and fees. There's a scholarship that you'll get, so. Um, mm -hmm. So tuition and fees for the 22-23 academic year was $46,506. Mm -hmm. um, living costs, which that includes 
room and board. So like all of your housing and then all your meal plan as well was just under 13,000 there. And then again, health insurance is optional. If you bring your own, you would you can just subtract that. Um, but if you purchase ours, it's right around two thousand mm-hmm. dollars per year. Um, so it brings the total out to about sixty one thousand four hundred forty six dollars. Mm-hmm. But every accepted international student does get um, a scholarship automatically. You don't even have to apply for it. Upon acceptance, mm-hmm. everybody gets that twenty five thousand mm-hmm. um, dollars to bring the cost down to about thirty five thousand per year but mm-hmm. you could be eligible for extra scholarships as well mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. based on like whatever activities you participated in, um, anything like that. Just talk to whoever your admissions counselor is here mm-hmm. and then we can try to bring that cost down even more if needed. Okay. Um, so mm-hmm. the average starting salary, the, the return on investment is like, uh, an, I feel like exponential just because mm-hmm. you're paying a little bit more, um, but, the education you'll get and the the average starting salary is you know double what you'd pay in one year. So it's you're getting very high paying, very very good jobs right after graduating. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's definitely worth it, I would say. Um, mm-hmm. And the job placement rate as well, because mm-hmm. we're very internship focused, and most of our students, if not all of them, do have some sort of internship, mm-hmm. at least one. Usually they're doing at least two or three during mm-hmm. their time here. Mm-hmm. Um, the job placement rate is is just even, you know, 96% is very high. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then here's just some examples of where MSUE graduates work. Um, uh-huh. Davidson is a big one. Google. We've had people work for Tesla Motors. So these are just some of the bigger names. But um, really, they work at all different companies um, mm-hmm. doing all kinds of different things. It's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> So then there's a couple different options for living on campus. We personally do require international students to live on campus for the first two years. Mm -hmm. Um, So here's one example of um, the apartment building that we have on campus that students can live in. Um, It's fully furnished. So you get your own bathroom, your own kitchen. Um, Mm -hmm. There's two beds in them, a dresser, you know, like everything like that. And then all utilities are included as well. So this is Mm -hmm. kind of a nice, alternative to the residence halls because it allows you a little bit more freedom to cook your own food and have more independent living but you're also still on campus and still connected in that way which is really nice Mm -hmm. and then here's our three residence halls um Herman Beats Tower is um, our newest one it just opened about a year ago and then uh, Margaret Lock Hall is similar, but it's not quite as updated, um, but it's very typical what you'd see like in the movies of the dorms where there's two people sharing a room and it's community floor, you know, shared bathrooms and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Regents Hall is reserved just for our female students. Mm-hmm. Um, it fills up pretty quickly, um, but it's suite style housing. So you have a shared bathroom and then you have typically four females who share two different rooms. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of a, a nice in between, mm-hmm. but it's it's it tends to fill up pretty quick because it is a nice um, alternative option. Mm-hmm. So a little bit about our admissions requirements. Um, we do require a three point grade point average, and we'll convert it to a, the U.S. scale, so you don't have to worry about that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we want to see a really strong math and science background um, because that's going to be like the the main kind of foundation of all of our programs here is like really heavy in math and science. Mm -hmm. Uh, We don't require the SAT or the ACT, but we do recommend, you know, if you're thinking about taking it, it would, it would be helpful, um, Mm -hmm. not just for us, but for other schools as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we do require either some sort of proof of English proficiency, whether it's a TOEFL or Mm -hmm. an IELTS. We do accept Duolingo um, Mm -hmm. lately as well. So that's a nice kind of option for students too. And then again, we don't need the financial guarantee or the passport to make the admission decision, but after you've been accepted and, you know, once you decide where you want to attend, that's when Mm -hmm. we would get those two documents. Um, Our application is free online, so you can just fill it out if you go to our website. It only takes about 10 or 15 minutes to fill out, so it's pretty easy. That's cool. Do you also accept um, common application? We do accept common app as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Yep. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so then the next steps would just be to apply. Um, here's my contact information, which I can stop sharing my screen if you want to show both of ours. Um, then we can certainly do that. But yeah, do we have any questions? 
Uh, I don't see any right now, but if there are any follow-up questions, guys, please uh, type them underneath the live stream and we will be happy, Lucia or myself, to reply either via email or underneath the live stream. But I don't need to share any screen. So guys, this has been streaming on our social media. So please leave any comments, leave any questions. And Lucia, thank you so much for introducing uh, your school and for uh, just you know, the, the STEM major is really interesting. And thank you for just joining us today. It was really yeah, interesting. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So thank you guys. And please leave us any comments or questions that you might have.